Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is Pascal's Law. Our objective is to introduce Pascal's Law and discuss the relationship of force, working pressure, and functional area as applied to fluid power systems. A brief note before we begin. I'm encouraging you to get involved with this lecture and pause it when asked to do so and solve for the desired quantities. Active learning necessitates you pick up a pencil and a scientific calculator and get busy. This isn't a lecture. This isn't a textbook. This is active learning, and it sure beats driving your piece of shit car to school in the middle of a winter storm or sitting in a stuffy class on a nice summer day. Although these skills may seem unwieldy at first, with repetitive exposure and practice, they will become second nature. As added incentive, you'll be overjoyed to know that calculations central to a thorough understanding of fluid power principles don't really get much harder than this. Take the time today to master these skills and just get this monkey off your back on a tight leash where it belongs and keep it there. The principle that largely governs the actuation strength of a fluid power system is Pascal's law, which in summation states that when force is applied to a fluid in a closed system, it exerts pressure equally and undiminished in all directions. Pascal's law can be represented graphically as a triangle with force represented as F at the apex and pressure represented as P and area represented as A forming the base. Similar to the shortcuts I demonstrated in the Ohm's Law lecture way back in the Basic Electronics 1 DC Circuit Analysis playlist, this triangle relationship is extremely handy. To solve for force, cover it up. Force equals pressure times area. To solve for pressure, cover it up. Pressure equals force over area. To solve for area, cover it up. Area equals force over pressure. Force is ordinarily measured in units of pounds force or newtons. Working pressure is ordinarily measured in units of pounds force per square inch, sometimes abbreviated as PSI, or alternatively as pascals or bars. A pascal is one newton of force applied to an area of one meter squared and a bar is equivalent to 14.5 PSI. Given a pascal is a comically small unit, you often see pressure represented using engineering prefixes as in kilopascals or megapascals. Area is ordinarily measured in units of square inches, square centimeters, or square millimeters. As discussed in the hydraulics math lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, different unit systems necessitate unit conversions and fluid power systems represent probably the only application in my mind where the SI metric system using engineering prefixes isn't nearly as easy as the U.S. customary system. I'll largely stick to the U.S. customary system for this lecture series. However, if you want to nerd out and perform the required unit conversions, be my guest. If you stick with units of force as pound force, pressure as PSI, and area as square inches, Pascal's law needs no unit conversion modifications. If, however, you wish to use force in units of newtons, pressure in units of kilopascals, and area in units of centimeters squared, Pascal's law necessitates the inclusion of a times 10 unit conversion. Given one of the permutations of Pascal's law states that force equals pressure times area, it can be demonstrated that force is directly proportional to both working pressure and functional area. The U.S. customary units demonstrate this behavior quite nicely. PSIs times inches squared. If a PSI is a pound force per inch squared, units of inches squared cancel, and we're left with units of pounds force. Permutations of Pascal's law demonstrate the following. Given constant functional area, increasing the working pressure directly increases the exerted force. Conversely, given constant functional area, decreasing the working pressure directly decreases the exerted force. Conversely, given constant working pressure, increasing the functional area directly increases the exerted force. Finally, given constant working pressure, decreasing the functional area directly decreases the exerted force. This relationship makes perfect sense. Think of a sailboat on a light wind day. If you want to go somewhere in light wind, you need a big sail. In contrast, on one of those nuking days when fish are being blown out of the water, you might need to trim the sails a little bit to stay in control or reduce your force. Simply by modifying pressure and functional area, 
one can control the exerted force. Given another, the permutations of Pascal's law demonstrates that pressure is equal to force divided by area. It can be demonstrated that pressure is directly proportional to force and inversely proportional to functional area. The US custom area units again demonstrate this behavior quite nicely. Pounds force over units of inches squared yield units of pounds per square inch, or PSI. This permutation of Pascal's law demonstrates the following. Given constant functional area, increasing the force directly increases the working pressure. Given constant functional area, decreasing the functional area decreases the working pressure. Conversely, given constant force, increasing the functional area decreases the working pressure. Finally, given constant force, decreasing the functional area increases the working pressure. This relationship makes perfect sense. Think of a big dude stepping on your foot wearing boots. It hurts, but not nearly as much as that same big dude stepping on your feet wearing high heels. The same force is concentrated in a much smaller area and results in a high pressure puncture wound. Let this be a cautionary tale. Stay alert and nimble whilst dancing with big dudes wearing high heels. Our final permutation of Pascal's law states that area is equal to force over pressure. It can be demonstrated that functional area is directly proportional to force and inversely proportional to working pressure. The US customary units again demonstrate this behavior quite nicely. Pounds force over PSI, where a PSI is a pound of force distributed over an area of one square inch, demonstrates that units of pounds force cancel out and we're ultimately left with units of inches squared. If working pressure was to remain constant, increasing the force means that area must increase. A larger force is spread over a larger functional area, resulting in constant pressure. Similarly, if working pressure is to remain constant, decreasing the force means area must decrease. A smaller force must be concentrated in a smaller functional area to result in a constant pressure. Conversely, if force is to remain constant, increasing the pressure means area must decrease. A larger pressure is applied to a smaller functional area, resulting in a constant force. Finally, if force is to remain constant, decreasing the pressure means area must increase. A smaller pressure is spread over a larger functional area, resulting in a constant force. This relationship again makes perfect sense. Given constant wind conditions, a larger sail would exert more force on a sailboat and a smaller sail would exert less. This three variable relationship of force, working pressure, and functional area makes perfect sense and algebraic manipulations of it should be the least of your concern. Additionally, the ramifications of increasing or decreasing one property while holding another constant should be self-evident and serve as excellent checks and calculated values. If your calculated values or assumptions say otherwise, check your calculated values and revisit your assumptions. All that's necessary for a thorough understanding of Pascal's law is the inclusion of numbers and an application of these properties. That and copious amounts of practice and synthesis of previous material. This portion of the lecture presumes you are thoroughly skilled in the calculation of circular and annular surface areas. If not, please take the time necessary to come up to speed by checking out or reviewing the Hydraulics Math Lecture available at the Big Bad Tech Channel. Consider an important application of Pascal's law to fluid power systems, that of force multiplication. Consider a movable piston face with a diameter of one inch inside a cylinder. Using our understanding of circular surface area, it can be calculated that a piston with a diameter of one inch represents a surface area of pi over four d squared, or approximately 0.7854 square inches. Consider a 180 pound dude standing on this cylinder. Pascal's law states that a pressure of force over area, or 180 pounds force over 0.7854 square inches, or 229.2 PSI is being distributed undiminished equally in all directions throughout this fluid. This means every square inch in this cylinder, top, bottom, and sides is experiencing 229.2 pounds of force. Pressure-induced force acts normal to the confined surface, meaning that the bottom, top, and sides are essentially being pushed outwards. 
This explains why a container incapable of withstanding this pressure would explode outwards and why a pinhole leak in this container would eject a thin stream of high pressure fluid. Be cautious around chintzy containers under high pressure. Let's assume, however, this cylinder is capable of withstanding this pressure-induced force and use the liquid trapped in this closed system to transmit the force to another larger cylinder linked via a hose. Given Pascal's law states that pressure on a confined fluid is transmitted undiminished in all directions, this fact can be used to our advantage. Let's say the diameter of cylinder 2 is 5 inches. Using our understanding of circular surface area, it can be calculated that a circle with a diameter of 5 inches represents a surface area of pi over 4 d squared, or approximately 19.6 square inches. Note this larger surface area at the top of cylinder 2, via Pascal's law, has the same pressure of 229.2 psi applied to it. If this surface area was in fact a movable piston, it would be expected to exert a larger force due to the increased surface area. This is a force multiplication system and forms the basis of a number of fluid power applications, especially those making use of manual pumps necessitating human muscle power to lift large loads. Pascal's law can be used to calculate the resultant force exerted by piston 2 to be force equals pressure times area. Substituting in the necessary values, we find F2 to be 4,500 pound force, essentially a 25 time increase from our original 180 pound force input. Force was applied to the smaller area of cylinder 1, resulting in a high pressure. This same high pressure was applied to the large area of cylinder 2, resulting in a high force. For those of you taken aback by this seeming violation of the conservation of energy, take note that energy is not force, but rather energy is force times distance. Let's say the travel length of cylinder 1 is 6 inches, or 0.5 feet. If energy is force times distance, this means 180 pounds force times 0.5 feet, or 90 foot pounds force of energy have been put into this system. Consider the volume of fluid displaced in the smaller cylinder 1 versus that displaced in the larger cylinder 2. Given the smaller cylinder was displaced a distance of 6 inches, how much volume of fluid did this displace in units of cubic inches? Volume is a three-dimensional quantity. Volume is area times height. A piston with a diameter of 1 inch, displaced a travel distance of 6 inches, has a volume of approximately 4.7 cubic inches. Given this is a closed fluid power system, and the volume of liquid confined within it not subject to change, any volume displaced in cylinder 1 is fed into cylinder 2 via the hose. Herein lies the resolution to our earlier quandary regarding the conservation of energy. How much does 4.7 cubic inches of fluid squeezed out of the smaller cylinder vertically displace the larger cylinder? The answer is not much. Given cylinder 2 represents a substantial increase in surface area, this obviously means the same volume won't displace this larger surface area nearly as much. Given the volume displaced in cylinder 1 is equivalent to the volume of fluid displaced in cylinder 2, and our known area of cylinder 2, we can algebraically rearrange this equation to solve for the displacement of cylinder 2. Substituting in the necessary values, we find that 4.7 cubic inches of liquid introduced into cylinder 2 would displace the larger piston only a height of 0.24 inches, just shy of a quarter of an inch. Force did go up 25 times, from 180 pounds force to 4,500 pounds force, but distance went down an equal 25 times amount. Using a unit conversion, it can be shown that 0.24 inches represents a distance of 0.02 feet. Therefore, the energy exerted by cylinder 2 is again force times distance, 4,500 pounds force times 0.02 feet equals 90 foot-pounds force of energy. The law of conservation of energy for this closed system holds true, and we can rest assured our calculations are not in error. Obviously, we're neglecting any inefficiencies due to leakage, resistance, or friction for this simple system. Accounting for these real-world inefficiencies, 
one could anticipate force, distance, and energy exerted by cylinder 2 to be some percentage less than these calculations. Regardless, the larger point of this exercise is this. Can you dig what is going on here? Our fluid power force multiplication system traded distance for force. Think of every time you had to jack up a car to change a spare tire. A human wouldn't ordinarily be able to lift a car. However, repeated long distance, low force strokes of the manual jack handle resulted in high force, small distance elevation gain. This is almost like the fluid power equivalent of a step down gearbox that exchanges the high speed, low torque output of a little motor for the low speed, high torque output of a shaft used to drive some load. Try this example problem on for size. Consider cylinder one with a three quarter inch diameter piston face and cylinder two with a three inch diameter piston face linked by a hose. First, calculate the surface area of both piston faces. Then, calculate the resultant pressure experienced by the confined fluid in this closed hydraulic system when 150 pounds of force is applied to piston one. Once you've got this figure, calculate the force exerted by the larger piston two. Next, determine the energy input into this system when piston 1 is displaced a vertical travel of 4 inches. Next, determine the volume of fluid displaced by cylinder 1 and how far this same volume displaces the much larger cylinder 2. Finally, determine the energy output by this system, assuming 100% efficiency. By all means, pause the lecture and take your best shot at this. If you're as skilled in the prerequisite lectures as I'm asking you to be, these answers are well within your reach. Keep in mind I've given you a pre-programmed path to success from point A to point Z, detailing each and every point along the way. Don't be surprised if some quiz, hint hint, dumps the same data on your desk and tells you to get to point Z without the pre-programmed instruction set. If you perform the calculations correctly, you should have come up with the following values. The area of a cylinder with a diameter of 3 quarters of an inch is 0.4418 inches squared. The area of cylinder 2 with a diameter of 3 inches is 7.0686 square inches. This represents a 16 times increase in area, and it should be small wonder that force increases 16 times and distance decreases 16 times. When 150 pounds of force is applied to piston 1, Pascal's law states that it exerts 339.5 psi. Pascal's law states that the same pressure exerted on the larger cylinder 2 results in a force of 2,400 pounds. Again, it's a 16 times increase from our original input of 150 pounds force. The energy input by cylinder 1 when 150 pounds force is exerted a distance of 4 inches or 0.333 feet results in 50 foot-pounds force of energy. The volume of a 3 quarter inch diameter cylinder displaced a distance of 4 inches is approximately 1.7671 cubic inches. Given this same volume displaced from cylinder 1 is fed into cylinder 2, it can be shown that the larger piston is displaced a distance of only 0.25 inches or 0.02083 feet. When 2,400 pounds of force is exerted for a distance of 0.02083 feet, it can be shown that cylinder 2 is exerting 50 foot-pounds force of energy. Again, the law of conservation of energy for this closed system holds true and could be rest assured that our calculations are not in error. Again, this fluid power force multiplication system traded distance for force. Given area went up 16 times, force went up 16 times, and distance went down 16 times. Moving on, consider applications of Pascal's law and the relationship of force, working pressure, and functional area to the act of extending and retracting a double acting cylinder. Working pressure is load dependent, meaning when unopposed, a cylinder can extend or retract with very little pressure, only requiring sufficient pressure to overcome friction between the dynamically moving surfaces of the piston and the barrel, and the rod and rod end plate. It makes sense. When little force is needed, working pressure needn't be high. As increasing load is applied to the cylinder, working pressure increases to that capable of generating the force sufficient to move the applied load. 
As previously discussed, surfaces with larger functional area necessitate less pressure to move the same load, and surfaces with less functional area necessitate more pressure to move the same load. Consider a double acting cylinder with a cap end and a rod end. Notice the difference between the functional area afforded by these two surfaces. The cap end is a full circle. The rod end is a circle with a circular portion removed from the center. Listen carefully to the two questions I'm about to ask. Which act requires more force, extending the double acting cylinder with 500 pounds of force or retracting the double acting cylinder with 500 pounds of force? And two, which act requires more pressure to move a 500 pound object, extending or retracting the double acting cylinder? The answer to the first question is neither. Both the act of extending and retracting at 500 pounds of force is an act that exerts 500 pounds of force. This is similar to the question, which weighs more, a pound of feathers or a pound of lead? Neither, since they both weigh a pound. The answer to the second question necessitates your understanding of functional area and the construction of double acting cylinders. Which end has more functional area? Which has less? No math. Just look at it. The cap end is a full circle. It has larger functional area. Given pressure is equal to force over area, to produce 500 pounds of extension force would necessitate less pressure because the functional cap end area is more. Conversely, the rod end is a circle with a circle removed. It has less functional area. To produce 500 pounds of retraction force would necessitate more pressure because the rod end functional area is less. You must understand this relationship. You must understand this picture. I simply cannot understand why some people cannot understand or refuse to understand this picture. Because of this area imbalance between cap and rod end, working pressure in a double acting cylinder is always less during extension than it is during retraction, giving the same force requirement. Similarly, working pressure in a double acting cylinder is always more during retraction than it is during extension, given the same force requirement because of the area imbalance between rod end and cap end. You must understand how a double acting cylinder is constructed and you must have a modicum of organization when it comes to putting the answers in the right spot when it comes to a quiz on the subject. Hint, hint. Consider a cylinder with a 1 and 5 8 inch cap diameter and a 7 8 inch rod diameter being asked to manipulate a supported 500 pound object laterally. Using our understanding of circular surface area calculations, it can be shown that the cap end has a functional area of 2.0739 square inches, the rod has an area of 0.6013 square inches, and the annular rod end has a functional area of 1.4726 square inches. Note the terms I'm using, cap end, rod, rod end. The rod end is the area of the cap minus the area of the rod. The rod end is an annular or ring-like shape. Pascal's law suggests that pressure equals force over area. The act of extending the cylinder with 500 pounds of force using the cap end functional area necessitates a working pressure of approximately 241.1 psi. Similarly, Pascal's law demonstrates the act of retracting the cylinder with 500 pounds of force using the smaller rod end functional area necessitates a working pressure of approximately 339.5 psi. Note that extension pressure is less than retraction to manipulate the same 500 pound load because of the area imbalance between cap end and rod end. Conversely, note the retraction pressure is greater than extension to manipulate the same 500 pound load because of the area imbalance between rod end and cap end. Use this simple check to ensure you haven't inadvertently transposed numbers. Consider this cylinder being used to manipulate a 300 pound object laterally. What is the force of extension and the force of retraction necessary to move this 300 pound object? Again, the force for both extending and retracting the cylinder is 300 pounds. That doesn't change. 
What is the pressure necessary to extend the cylinder with 300 pounds? And what is the pressure necessary to retract the cylinder with 300 pounds of force? By all means, pause the lecture and take a stab at this. Note that given the applied load has been reduced from 500 to 300 pounds in comparison to our first scenario, the working pressure exerted while in the act of extending or retracting should decrease. Let's see if this is the case. Pascal's law demonstrates the act of extending the cylinder with 300 pounds force using the cap end functional area necessitates a working pressure of 144.7 psi. Similarly, Pascal's law demonstrates the act of retracting the cylinder with a force of 300 pounds using the smaller rod end functional area necessitates a working pressure of approximately 203.7 psi. Note the difference between extension and retraction pressure to manipulate the same load because of the area imbalance between cap end and rod end. Note that working pressure is that pressure necessary to actually move an applied load. The working pressure while extending at 300 pounds is less than the pressure necessary to extend at 500 pounds. It makes sense. Similarly, the working pressure required to retract at 300 pounds is less than the pressure necessary to retract at 500 pounds. In keeping with this theme, working pressure should go up for a larger load. Let's prove it. What is the working pressure necessary for this cylinder to extend with 800 pounds of force? What is the working pressure necessary for this cylinder to retract with 800 pounds of force? By all means, pause the lecture and take a shot at this. After all, you got your pencil and calculator sitting right there. Put them to good use. Pascal's law demonstrates the act of extending the cylinder with 800 pounds of force using the larger cap end functional area necessitates a working pressure of approximately 385.7 psi. Similarly, Pascal's law demonstrates the act of retracting the cylinder with 800 pounds of force using the smaller rod end functional area necessitates a working pressure of approximately 543.2 psi. Notice for all scenarios the difference between extension and retraction pressures to manipulate the same load because of the area imbalance between cap end and rod end. Additionally, notice as the load progressively increases from 300 to 500 to 800 pounds, the working pressure progressively increases regardless if the cylinder is extending or retracting. Again, working pressure is the pressure necessary to actively extend or retract the applied load working pressure is load dependent. Maximum pressure in contrast is that pressure a fluid power system is capable of achieving before being actively limited by pressure control devices like a pressure relief valve and above which the system could be damaged. Consider a fully extended or fully retracted cylinder that's reached the limits of travel or consider an extending or retracting cylinder with the opposite port blocked such that no fluid can escape to the tank. Liquids, for the purposes of this lecture series, are to be considered incompressible. In all these scenarios, the cylinders effectively reach the limits of travel and pressure will begin to rise from the load-induced working pressure to the maximum pressure permitted by the system. We'll examine the device that limits maximum pressure, the pressure relief valve, in later lectures. For now, consider a system as having an upper pressure limit above which working pressure cannot surmount. Consider a system limited to 300 psi maximum pressure. Could this cylinder manipulate a 300 pound load? The answer is yes. Both the pressures necessary to extend and retract the cylinder with 300 pounds force are below the 300 psi maximum pressure limit. Could this system limited to 300 psi manipulate a 500 pound load? The answer is not really. The working pressure necessary to extend the cylinder is below the 300 psi maximum pressure limit. However, the working pressure necessary to retract the cylinder is above the 300 psi maximum pressure limit. One could extend the cylinder and applied 500 pound load, but not retract it due to the increased working pressure necessary due to the smaller functional area provided by the rod end. Could this system limited to 300 psi manipulated an 800 pound load? The answer is no in both cases. Both extension and retraction working pressures are above this system's 300 psi maximum pressure limit. What is the maximum force that this cylinder can extend and retract given pressure is limited to 300 psi? 
Pascal's law states that the maximum extension force is the maximum pressure times the area of the cap end. The maximum extension force of this system limited at 300 psi is therefore approximately 622.2 pounds. Similarly, the maximum retraction force of this system is the maximum pressure times the smaller functional area of the rod end, which yields a maximum retraction force of approximately 441.8 pounds force. What if this process did necessitate the regular manipulation of 300 pound loads? In this case, a technician knowledgeable of Pascal's law tasked with upgrading this system has two available options at his or her disposal. Either they can increase the pressure or increase the area. Given force is equal to pressure times area, either manipulation or a combination of both could serve to increase the resultant force of our system. Consider the simple act of just adjusting the pressure relief valve so maximum pressure is no longer limited to 300 psi, but rather 600 or even 5,000 psi, thereby allowing this existing system to manipulate an 800 pound load with plenty of room to spare. The solution is not without its complications though. Can the existing motor driven pump provide sufficient flow at the increased pressure requirements? Can the existing hoses and fittings handle the increased pressure, especially when pegged at the ridiculous limit of 5,000 psi? If not, consider keeping the maximum pressure limited to 300 psi and simply swapping out the existing cylinder with one with increased functional area. Consider a cylinder with a 2.5 inch diameter cap end and the same 7 8 inch diameter rod. The cap end area for this larger cylinder now represents approximately 4.9 square inches of functional area and the rod end represents approximately 4.3 square inches of functional area. Given the larger functional area for both cap end and rod end, how does this affect working pressure for extension and retraction when handling an 800 pound load? Pressure at extension is equal to the force divided by the functional area of the cap end. Substituting in the necessary values, we find this larger cylinder necessitates a working pressure of only 163 psi. Similarly, we find this larger cylinder necessitates a working pressure of only 185.7 psi to retract it. The larger cylinder, therefore, allows us to manipulate the 800 pound load without exceeding the 300 psi maximum pressure limit. Consider the increased load range capable of being handled by this larger cylinder. Given force equals pressure times area, when working pressure is pegging our previous limit of 300 psi, the larger cylinder can extend using the cap end area with up to 1,472.6 pounds force and retract using the rod end area with approximately 1,292.2 pounds force. Again, proving the larger cylinder has more than sufficient force to toss around the 800 pound load like a hacky sack in a liberal arts college parking lot. The solution is not without its complications though. Note a larger cylinder does provide increased functional area. However, it similarly increases the volume of space the pump must fill to fully extend and retract the cylinder. The existing motor driven pump may not provide sufficient flow to actuate the larger volume cylinder within the desired time period. This is to suggest that safety, effectiveness, costs, benefits, and the cold hard limits of time and money must be taken into consideration. Before we wrap this lecture up, let's do one more illustrated example problem. Given a huge cylinder with a 6 inch diameter cap and a 2 inch diameter rod, Determine the working pressure for both extension and retraction given the cylinder is tasked with pushing and pulling 5,000 pound containers on and off barges. Additionally, determine the maximum extension and retraction force of the system given maximum pressure is limited to let's say 400 psi. Finally, can this system as currently implemented push and pull two containers on or off at once? If not, what modifications might be necessary to do so. By all means, pause the lecture and take your best shot at this. Note, I did not give you a detailed roadmap for this illustrated example problem. It's up to you to pick the best route to the solutions. If you perform the calculations, you should have obtained the following results. The cap end area is 28.2743 square inches. The area of the rod end is approximately 25.1327 square inches. Note area calculations are often the first stop one makes on a road trip to Solution Town. This isn't always the case and watch out for occasions when an especially devious instructor tricks you into performing unnecessary calculations. However, area calculations are almost as essential as filling up your car with gas, 
and making sure your car has four wheels when it comes to force, pressure, and area calculations. Pascal's law shows that to extend with 5,000 pounds of force using the larger cap end area necessitates a working pressure of approximately 176.8 psi. Similarly, Pascal's law shows that to retract with 5,000 pounds of force using the smaller rod end area necessitates a working pressure of approximately 198.9 psi. Given the system is limited to 400 psi maximum, Pascal's law shows that this system would be able to produce a maximum extension force of approximately 11,309.7 pounds force. Similarly, Pascal's law shows that this system would be able to produce a maximum retraction force of approximately 10,053.1 pound force. So the answer to our final question is a definitive maybe. Given each container represents a 5,000 pound load, two of them together would represent a 10,000 pound load. The system as currently implemented could theoretically push two containers onto the barge simultaneously. However, I sincerely doubt it would be able to pull two containers off the barge simultaneously because the force of retraction at this pressure limit is only slightly over the requirement, accounting for inefficiencies due to leaks, friction, unintended pressure drops, and any play between the mechanically coupled loads. I sincerely doubt this system as currently implemented would be able to do this in the real world. This is to suggest that Pascal's law calculations represent theoretical maximums only. Real world complications must be taken into account. Don't be the person that thinks it's going to work out perfectly and be totally shocked when it doesn't. Long story short, when you got to kill a lion, a spear might do the job, but a high power rifle has a significantly greater chance of success. Taking into account these realities, a technician presented with a system necessitating more force has two options available, either increase maximum pressure or increase functional area. Both options serve to increase force. However, due to pressure limits imposed by the existing fittings and monetary and time constraints, let's pretend neither of these upgraded modifications are feasible. A third option exists that requires minimal modifications to our system and a little out of the container thinking. Consider relocating the offloading cylinder from the dock onto the barge during an offload such that when the cylinder extends, it pushes two containers onto the dock simultaneously. Aha! Given the same cylinder and the same maximum pressure limit, this relocated system can now offload from barge to dock by extending with a maximum of 11,309.7 pounds force rather than retracting with a maximum of 10,053.1 pounds force. During offload, the system would be mounted onto the boat tied to the dock so it is capable of pushing two containers off the boat onto the dock by extending. During onload, the system could be remounted on the dock so it is capable of pushing two containers onto the boat by likewise extending. As this tricky solution demonstrates, the act of extending or retracting a cylinder can mean two totally different things when it comes to the desired task, doubly so for systems including additional mechanical linkages. Keep in mind, the previous illustrated example problems featured cylinders laterally pushing and pulling fully supported loads, not lifting or lowering loads against the force of gravity. Consider these two different orientations used to lift and lower loads. To lift load A, pressurized flow must enter the cap end and cylinder A must extend the rod. In contrast, lifting load B requires pressurized flow to enter the rod end and retract the rod to lift load B. This is to again suggest that the act of extending or retracting a cylinder can mean two totally different things when it comes to the desired task pending mounting orientation. Cylinder A lifts on extend. Cylinder B lifts on retract. Given identical loads and identical cylinders, which orientation requires more pressure to lift the load? If you said cylinder B, you are correct. The pressure differential to lift the same load on retraction is because of the fundamental area imbalance between the cap end and rod end area. Again, you must understand how a double acting cylinder is constructed and how the functional area affects working pressure. As a further concern for lifted loads, 
consider the influence of gravity on these two configurations. Lifting the load, either through extension or retraction against the force of gravity, is similar to our previous illustrated example problems featuring fully supported, laterally manipulated loads. However, the act of lowering the loads, either through retraction or extension, presents us with an overrunning load scenario and a whole lot of problems. The same thing goes for tipping and tilting applications where past a certain point, the load becomes negative. Given cylinder A lowers on retraction, and given little pressure is present in the cap end to slow the descent of the lifted or tilted object, the lifted load in cylinder would crash to the limits of travel and perhaps beyond. Similarly, if cylinder B lowers on extension, given little pressure is present on the rod end to slow the descent of the lifted object, the load in cylinder would crash to the limits of travel and perhaps beyond. Later lectures will examine flow control methods and counterbalance valves used to control the descent of a lifted object. Long story short, both methods serve to restrict or control fluid from leaving the supporting end such that pressurized fluid is always available to resist the overrunning nature of the lowering load. Alright, this about wraps up our brief introduction to Pascal's Law. In conclusion, this lecture took a brief look at the relationship between working pressure, functional area, and force, known as Pascal's Law. Additionally, we examine applications of Pascal's Law, including force multiplication, and scenarios involving extending and retracting cylinders. Finally, we discuss maximum pressure limitations and how different cylinder orientations and mounting methods may influence the force, pressure, and resultant mechanical movement. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.